everybody to our <coughs> services this morning. Uh, Pastor is not able to be here uh, today. Uh, Miss Ming is not uh, feeling well, so let's continue to pray for her and uh, he's, he's <coughs>
Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone? Good. Good. I tell you, it's good to be in the house of the Lord any day, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord on a holiday. And I appreciate you being here on a holiday. Most times, churches are pretty skimpy and lean on a holiday. And I appreciate you being here. Uh, I apologize for uh, being the man being behind the pulpit today because uh, I know that uh, Dad would love to be here. He, this is where he wants to be. Um, he loves coming to church. He loves seeing your faces. And my mom is just not doing so good this weekend. Um, and uh, he, uh, he needed to stay home with her today. And so pray for them if you would. If they're not already on your prayer list, I pray you, I just hope that you'll put them on your prayer list and pray for them and keep them in your prayers. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn to the very first book, the very first chapter, and the very first verse. Today I want to attempt to preach from Genesis to Revelation. Ain't that going to be a blessing? <laughs> <clears throat> you, can, you can tell your friends the, the idiot that preached to us on Sunday <laughs> preached all the way through the entire book from Genesis to Revelation. Let's begin reading in the very first verse of the book of the Bible. In the beginning, God, <clears throat> God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and called darkness, and darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord. I give thanks for the privilege it is to hold this precious book and to know about it and to know that the mysteries of the universe and the mysteries of all that is is inside the cover of this book. Help us to treasure it, Lord, and understand the power that it possesses to not only hold the world in place, but to hold our world in place. Hold our lives in place. And Lord, whatever problem we're facing, whatever thing that we need, Lord, this book is the answer. Because this book is the printed form of Christ. It is the Word that became flesh and then became Word again so that we can hold. Help us to treasure this book as treasure in Christ. Open our eyes today that we can see. Help us to see what the Lord would have us to see. And help us to understand that the time is short. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I don't know what kind of prayer is going on around right now, but uh, I got a little, a little, a little touch of it, and so my throat's a little messy. Pardon me if I have to pause and drink. <clears throat> so this this narrative, this first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter one. We know as the account of, of creation. <clears throat> this is the Moses account of creation. And uh, it, it starts from the very beginning, goes down and really focuses on man. But in truth, there are five accounts of creation in Scripture. I mean, there's many scattered in small verses throughout. But there are five primary passages of the creation. And the reason I'm telling you this is because if you just read Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> you're just going to get a little fragment. But if you'll read all of them together, you'll see a much bigger picture and you'll have a much greater understanding of the creation. Why we're here, what this is all about. It's interesting because I didn't really grasp the fullness of our Sunday school lesson today until we were actually here talking about it. Uh, and I hope you read your Sunday school lesson because it kind of fits hand in hand with this. <clears throat> but there are five accounts uh, of creation, and it gives us a broader understanding of what is and why it is. Uh, <clears throat> the, next ver the next passage that talks about creation is found in Job chapter 38. 
And the next one is found in Psalm chapter 104. The next one is found in Proverbs chapter 8. And the next one is found in John chapter 1. If you brought a piece of paper with you, I think you should probably write some of this stuff down. Because I hope you'll go back and revisit this in your quiet time. It'll be a blessing to you. <clears throat> So the first account is Genesis 1, then Job 38 through 41, Psalms chapter 104, and Proverbs chapter 8, and John chapter 1. And what's unique about these is the people that write them give the creation story a unique voice. See, in the book of, in the book of Genesis, it's Moses. In the book of Job, it's God himself talking to Job about creation. In Psalm 104, it's David telling us some things about creation. In the book of Proverbs, it's the sworn deposition of wisdom. Did you know that wisdom is a living spirit? Mm -hmm. And it's feminine in nature. And Psalms, I mean, Proverbs chapter 8 is a sworn deposition, just that one chapter, a sworn deposition from wisdom talking about God possessing wisdom in the beginning when he was creating the world. Then the last one, John chapter 1, is obviously written by John, which tells us about what was in the beginning, and it was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. We know that is Jesus became the Word, and he dwelt among us. <clears throat> so there are so many aspects of the creation story but there's one particular aspect I want us to focus on today, and it's found in Proverbs chapter 8, part of the sworn deposition of wisdom. So look with me, if you would, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time because I have a feeling this might be kind of a lengthy message, but I promise you to stick with me. It has a pretty big punch at the end. It's kind of like one of those long jokes that somebody tells you. It's like, oh, come on, come on. And then they tell you the, the, the punchline, you're rolling in the floor. Well, this is kind of like that. <clears throat> Except it's not a punchline. It's something powerful. So this is, the focus is wisdom giving a sworn deposition about what it witnessed with God having it in, in his possession to create the world. And I want us to focus on this because in chapter 8 of Proverbs, we get a portion of scripture that is not found anywhere else in scripture. And it, it's, the, it's the account that there are three time zones in all of the universe. Did you know there were three time zones? You can shake your head or whatever. But there are three time zones. So I want us to look, it begins in verse 12. Where it, the sworn deposition starts, you can just almost see wisdom raising its hand. It says, I wisdom. So it's got its hand up, giving its sworn deposition. I, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. And then it tells us about the fear of the Lord. Just a real brief fear of the Lord. If you ever wondered what the fear of the Lord is, it's in this next verse. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Very simple. Pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. So that's the things that wisdom hates. If we, if we would follow wisdom, and we would be good to know that the fear of the Lord is simply to hate evil. Okay? And then wisdom begins to tell us things about itself, to kind of give itself some credibility. It says, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. Next verse, by me, kings reign. By, and the next one, by me, princes rule. 17, I love them that love me. 18, riches and honor are with me. 19, my fruit is better than gold. And then it says in verse 20, I lead in the way of righteousness, verse 21, that I may cause those that love me to have substance. <clears throat> and let's keep reading there. And I will fill their tre treasures. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Now that's a clue to us that before what we read in Genesis chapter 1, 1, there was something going on prior to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Because before God made anything, God was. He was here. And he's the one that started making stuff in Genesis 1. 1. It says, it says um, 
the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Now look at this verse 23. Here's the time zones. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. So there are three time zones, and it's the period before the beginning, it's the period of the beginning, and then it's the period of the earth. And I want us to look at those today because it's very important for you to know how God set things up, and he did it with wisdom, and it's powerful. It's very powerful, and I don't know that you probably have ever seen it or considered it before, but in, in this time that we live in, when I think we're so close to the end, we're so close to leaving with him, I think we kind of need to know where we're going to go and what where that exists in. I know that whenever we were kids, we planned trips to go on little trips together as a family. I remember when I was like 12 or 13, I don't know, maybe 12, we decided we were going to go to Six Flags. And so we talked a little bit about what that was like. I'd never been to Six Flags before. And I began, I began to find out what Six Flags was about and what it was like. It was kind of like Bell's Amusement Park in Tulsa, except it was on steroids. And it was lots of big, giant uh, roller coasters and rides and stuff. And I got excited. Well, when I was 12, I was kind of like a poodle. I didn't do excitement real well. <laughs> My sisters, no. <laughs> And so we took off to Six Flags. <laughs> and when you go around Dallas and you kind of go over this little rise, you can see Six Flags in the distance. And I had to throw up. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> and then we had to pull over and I, I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And once we got to Six Flags, every time we'd get up to a ride, we'd almost get up there, and I'd have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I didn't ride a thing. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I want you guys to be excited to know that we're getting ready to go to a place that you can't even imagine. And I want to describe some things today that it's really not supposed to be something that you can wrap your head around because we can't. Scripture tells us we can't wrap our head around it. But I'm going to show you some things that are in Scripture for us to know. It begins with coming to understand what the time zones are. And I hope as we get close to seeing this thing we're going to see today, you'll get excited. Hopefully it won't be so exciting not to get up and go to the back. But it's, I hope it's something that will stir your heart. And realize that we're so close to being there. Amen. And we're so close to going. Amen. So the three time zones are from everlasting. So one time zone is called everlasting. One time zone is called the beginning. And the other time zone is called the earth. <clears throat> so before there was a beginning, something that started marking time, there was a place that existed called the everlasting. What did, it, what did that look like? Well, we go to David who tells us in Psalm chapter 104 a little bit. He gives us just a little glimpse. Go with me to Psalm 104 so we can see what was present. Psalm 104. And we know that who was present because God was present in the everlasting before he started his work. It says in Psalm 104, verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with majesty, honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. Look at this next line. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So the very first thing that God did in Genesis 1-1 was he created a heaven and an earth, right? So before that line in verse 2 where it says he stretches out the heavens like a curtain, here is what it looked like before then. Number one, God's very great. He's great. 
He's not just great, he's very great. And he is in that, in that place that he's in, he is clothed with honor and majesty. <coughs> and then on top of that, he wraps himself in a garment of light. So what did it look like prior to the beginning in this place called everlasting? It is a majestic king who is clothed in light. That's what was there. And that's what it looked like. And then God created, the, in the beginning, the heaven and the earth. Why did he create a heaven first? The heaven and the earth. He created the heaven first because no man could see God, be in his presence, or look at him without dying, without perishing. We would be obliterated if we saw God in his magnificence. So to protect us from his beauty, his holiness, his righteousness, he created a space, a heaven, and inside of it he put an earth because he knew the ultimate outcome is there would be people there he could reveal himself to. And so he put us in a place where we're protected from the thing that would destroy us if we saw his beauty. That's what it was like in this place called the everlasting. The first person to tell us about the everlasting person was Abraham. Father Abraham. Father Abraham tells us uh, in Genesis chapter 21, verse 33. I want you to see it. Look with me. Genesis chapter 21, verse 33. This is some a little bit of time after Je uh, uh, Abraham had left his home. He had gotten to know the Lord. And then the kind of the outcome of that getting to know the Lord, this is what the scripture says in verse 21, or chapter 21, verse, come on, what can we do? 21, verse 33, look at this. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord. Look at that. The everlasting God. Here it's acknowledged that there is a place that exists called the everlasting. And there is the God there that is the everlasting God. Deuteronomy chapter 33. I want you to go there as well. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Verse 27. <clears throat> Let's begin in, in verse 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting Arms. When I was a kid, there was a very famous popular song we sang in the church, and I think there was a little hit on the radio for a few for just a little bit of time. It's called You Got the Whole World in His Hands. Remember that? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. You guys are all young. Yeah. I don't remember that. <laughs> right? We, you remember, right? He's got the whole world in his hands. Literally, God is holding it all together in his everlasting <laughs> arms. Amen. Amen. Did you under, you understand what I just said? God is holding this whole mess in his arms. In his arms, in his hands. And he will until it's over. And this is the everlasting God who lives in an everlasting place that we have never been to, we have never yet seen, because if we saw him, we would not live. <clears throat> Now look at Psalm chapter 92. Psalm 92. I'm sorry, that's 90 period, verse 2. Let's begin with verse 1. Thou, that Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Thou hast been our dwelling place. 
those everlasting arms. And it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And then one more. Psalm 93. <clears throat> I love this from a class. If I just say, so, Miss Robin, where are you from? Where are you from? Karen. Karen, where are you from? Oh, that one was hard, wasn't it? Karen's from Tulsa. <laughs> I was born in Henrietta. She was born in Henrietta. I was born in Henrietta. But we've spent the majority of our life in Tulsa. <laughs> Miss Lydia, where do you say you're from? Eufaula. Eufaula. Where do you say you're from? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Okay. So everybody can say, well, where are you from? I'm from this place. I want you to look at this. This is Psalm chapter 93. Let's begin in verse 1. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. There's that word again. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he has girded himself. The world also established that cannot be removed. Thy throne is established of old. Now, where is God from? It says it right there. Thou art from everlasting. This is the time zone where God Almighty, the eternal God, the everlasting God lives. So this is the space that existed prior to the beginning. Who lives there? <clears throat> Who lives there? God alone. God himself. And then came the beginning. The beginning. The thing that we know of from Genesis chapter 1. Look with me back again at Genesis chapter 1. Let's just go through this real quickly. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. If you have a Bible that says heavens, it is an erroneous Bible. I hope your Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. You have a Bible that says heavens, it is a fake Bible. Yeah, I said that. Not politically correct to say it, but we kind of live in an age where people say things that aren't necessarily politically correct. Be, be assured, church, there can only be one truth. If there's not just one truth, that'd be like the state of Oklahoma having six or seven different versions of the law. You could never prosecute anybody if there were six or seven versions of the law. You just can't. Because someone would pick a law that satisfied them, and, they, and then they would get out of whatever it is they were in trouble with. There could only be one. <clears throat> and the scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heaven <coughs> and the earth. One heaven, one earth, earth in the beginning. This is a Bible authenticator. If you want to know how to tell somebody if they have an authentic Bible, just go to book one, chapter one, verse one. Look there. Does it say heaven or does it say heavens? <clears throat> How many errors have to be in a Bible for it to be fake? One. Just one. And there it is. If it's multiple heavens at the first, it's a fake. Okay? Just get that straight. <clears throat> now we know because of Proverbs chapter 8, which denotes different time zones, there is more than one heaven. But it, there wasn't in the beginning. There was just one heaven, one earth. In fact, let's just keep going. In this particular time zone that began here, the beginning, there is a new time zone established. And I want you to see what the time calculation is. By the way, in the everlasting time zone, time is not calculated. There is no time calculated in the everlasting it is everlasting, it's eternal. No time calculation. Now in the beginning, there is a new thing called time, and it is being calculated. And I want you to look at what, where the scripture tells us what that time zone is. I am so excited I'm on the last page of my notes. <clears throat> I didn't think I'd be able to do that. <clears throat> so there are two places in scripture that tells us how to calculate, calculate the beginning time zone. Look with me in Psalm chapter 90. Verse 4. <clears throat> well, let me get there. Let me verse 4. Now, for those of you who like to talk 
about the Lord to other people. This is going to be, I'm not telling you, we've done, this is going to be a great tool for your toolbox to talk to people about the Lord. It's just, it's a great tool. So, the second time zone, the beginning time zone, is calculated differently. You'll recognize it when you see it. Psalm chapter 90, verse 4. <clears throat> For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Now look over to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. <clears throat> 2 Peter is just a few books before the Revelation. So who lives in the beginning time zone? Which God? Not the everlasting God. The beginning God. And that is God the Father that we know is the Father of Jesus Christ. This is his time zone. And in his time zone, the time is calculated in 1,000 years. A day is 1,000 years. And 1,000 years is one day. So how do we get this 24-hour day thing? Well, you have to read in Genesis chapter 1. Let's read it real quick. <clears throat> so we're going we're gonna to go beyond chapter 1, verse 5. We already read that at the beginning. So the evening and the morning were the first day. This is that's at the end of verse 5. And verse 6 says, And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let them divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. That was a mouthful. And God called the firmament, look, what did he call it? Yeah. Heaven. So now there's another heaven. There's the one that he made at the beginning with the earth, and then on the second day, he made a firmament, and he called it heaven. And so now there's an everlasting time zone, there's a beginning time zone, and he's going to do something else now under that heaven where the earth is. So on the third day, what he does is he gathers all the waters together in the places that we know as the seas, and he plants some grass, and on the fourth day he turns on the light. That's when he puts the sun, the moon, and the stars and guess what happens when he places the sun, moon, and stars? A new time zone begins. That's the one we know about. It's the 24-hour day. The 365 days in a year time zone. So now we have three time zones. <clears throat> we have the everlasting. We have the beginning that's calculated by 1,000 years. And we have another that's calculated by 24-hour days. And it's controlled and it's calculated by the sun. And its revolution around the earth. Or the earth's revolution around the sun. I should say that. I don't believe in the flat earth. Some of you might, you might not believe that. I don't believe that. <clears throat> so why is this important? Why is it important for us to know this? Well, in the everlasting time zone is God, the everlasting God. Then there's God the Father, who is the Father of Jesus. Then there's the earth where we live, where Jesus was sent to die for our sins. And he ascended back into heaven. That's where he sits at the right hand of the Father. Okay? You follow me? <clears throat> and this place on earth, after he came and he died for us, led to a point in time, the year was 1611, when King James received a book and he commissioned 50 some odd translators to translate so that we would have a copy of the Bible. Why is that? Because the only thing that existed in the everlasting was God the light. What was God the light? The word. 
That's all that's out there. Did you know the only thing that's exactly the same on earth as it is in the everlasting is the word. They're the same. That's why it's important for you to have the accurate one. Why is, what, what does that mean? <clears throat> the most important verse you learn as a person. What is it? Do you hear that? What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. By the way, that's the title of the message today. Whosoever believeth in him will have what? Because one day, all of this is going to be gone. Mm -hmm. You know, if the Lord came back today, there'd be seven years of tribulation on the earth. Don't recommend anybody to be here. We're going to be in heaven having the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to come back with him on horses. We'll reign here on earth with him, his spiritual bride. And we're going to, he's going to deal with his people Israel for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, it's over. There is, there's no more. It says time will be no more. There will be no more time. And all of this is going to be folded up. And guess where those who believe in him are going to be? We're going to have everlasting life. We will be back where it all started. But what do you got to do to have everlasting life? You have to believe in him. Well, who is him? Well, in this time that we live in, This is him. This is him. You know, you all have a version of a book inside your blood, in your cells. And it's the it's the, it's the scripture. It's the scripture of Miss Robin. You have one too, Miss Lydia. This one. This one is the DNA of Christ. And you have to believe in him have everlasting life. See this process that started, see we're at the end of the 9,000th year of time. And there's just one more time period. You know, it's calculated in 1,000 years from God's perspective. And then there's just the 10,000th year and it's over. We just have one more time period left. It's the 10,000th year. And this time that we live in is the church age. And this is where people have been given this book so that we can read it, study it, love it, learn it. Why? So when we believe in it, we can have everlasting life. We can go to a place that he is. What's going to happen when all of this stuff is gone? And this is why I look back to our lesson this morning, brother. Where, where it's funny because it kind of sounds like a downer when Solomon says vanity, vanity, all his vanities. That's because everything here is just props. Did you know that? Your vehicles, your money, your cat. <laughs> so he's got a great cat. All of its props. For what? To judge how we are going to handle this book. If we're going to be obedient to it. If we're going to love it. If we're going to serve the Lord being guided by this book because there is nothing else. Everything is props. And when you hear Solomon say, vanity, vanity, all his vanities, it's because sometime in the future it's all going to be gone. And you know what Jesus said about this book? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. That's right. This, dear church, is what we need to invest our life in. Not more, not, not more cell phone time, not more tablet time, not more TV time. We need, to step, we need to spend more time in this book. We need more time sharing it with others. The time is short. The, the ark is about to close. The door is about to close. And nobody else is going to be able to get in. I told you this whole thing today so you could know the painstaking thing that God went through to get his word where he's at through the beginning time zone, down to our time zone, to Christ coming to earth to give his life for us so that we could have in our hands the thing that exists 
outside of everything. He wanted us to have this. That's how powerful this book is. That's the wallop I was telling you. If you just wait and let me tell the whole story. This, and you're like, that's it? Oh, yeah, that's it. There is nothing else. Let me tell you something. Whenever I was a young man, I did some bad things. I was a bad, I was a very bad person. If you'd ask most people when I was in the I was in the middle of my life of sin, if there was any hope for me. Yes, my dad. Yes, my dad back then, if there's any hope for me, he probably told you no. Let me tell you something. God put me in a place where I couldn't move, couldn't squirm, couldn't get out of it. You know what he did? He brought me a book. He brought me that book. And I didn't have anything to do but just read it. Everything else was gone. <coughs> and I sat in my own darkness one night. I began to read and I read it over and over, cover to cover, several learning about God and I fell in love with him because he is the Lord. And tonight, today, I came to tell you about a God that lives in the everlasting time zone where time is not calculated. Who transcended an entire time zone that where God the Father lives, who sent Jesus down to earth, down to our time zone of 24 hours. He did all of that so he could introduce himself to us through a book. And here we sit in that time period. Isn't that amazing that, that, that the God of the universe would go to such painstaking obstacles to get us a book so we could know him. I'm going to tell you, if you don't know him, there is, no there is no relationship with God outside the world. If you don't know him, you can't get to where he's at. You'll be lost. And so today, I just want to beg you that if you don't know him, please get to know him. Accept him as Lord and Savior. If you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, maybe you need to rededicate your life and get closer to him by reading the book. Just read the book. Get to know him and let him change your life. There's a song out there that I love. It says, how's that go? Let my Jesus change your life. I think the name of the song is my Jesus. And it says, let my Jesus change your life. And God can change your life if he hasn't already. If you're struggling with something today, let me say something. Everything that we face is there. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, because all that matters is your relationship with the Lord. We can stop struggling today if we'll forget about all the props that are around us and just cling to the Word, focus on Him, and let Him change our lives. Because when He changes our lives, we can go out into a world that is desperately lost, desperately dying, and needs to hear the hope. God in heaven, way out in the heavens, that loves us. Have you ever heard of the seven, he seven heavens? You that there were seven heavens. Have you heard that before? That there are seven heavens. Have you ever heard that? There is a TV show called Seven Heaven. And it's taken from the concept that there are seven heavens. I'm just going to tell you what they are. So where we live in the, the, and where, where we are right now, it's just above us where we can't reach where the trees grow up into, where the birds fly, where the airplanes fly. That is the first heaven. Beyond that, where we go through the ion sphere and the gravity forces and we go into where the planets are, that's the second heaven. And then there's a third heaven. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 20, I think it's 20 verse 2. Let me see real quick. I just want to get this in there. No, it's 2 Corinthians 12 too. Look at that real quick. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in body I cannot tell, or whether out of body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven. What is the third heaven? Well, it's where a door exists. What door is that? Revelation chapter 4 tells us uh, in, in 
Verse 1, after this I looked and behold, the door was open in heaven. And the first voice I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. It said, come up here and I will show you things which must be hereafter. So there's a door that's at the third heaven. So here we are. Here's the earth. Here we are. That's the first heaven where the trees grow into and the birds fly and the airplanes fly. And then the next one above it is where the planets are. And then there's the third heaven, which is kind of like an outer perimeter that keeps all of us. It's that, it's that second heaven that he created on day two. And there's a door there that we're going to go through when we leave. When you go into that door, that's that where that is, that's where God the Father lives, in the fourth heaven. And above him is where the angels fly, in the fifth heaven. And then above that is that first heaven that he created, the first one. And that is the sixth heaven. And the place where God the everlasting Father, or the everlasting God lives, that's the seventh heaven. So you can... You, you can get a picture of what these heavens are just by things you learn out of Scripture. That book is powerful, I'm telling you. It's powerful. Do you know it? You need to get to know it. You need to get an idea of where we're going. Because let me tell you something. I'm so excited, I might have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> are you excited about going to see? Heavenly <clears throat> Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to get to know Thee through this precious book. To understand who we are in Thee and where we're going and what's coming, Lord. Nothing should ever catch a Christian off guard because we've been told the way, because, Lord, Thou art the way, the truth. Lord, if there's anyone here today that does not know me, help them to get that right today. If there's someone here that's carrying a burden, help them, Lord, to get that right today. We're too close to the end. Help us to cling to Thee. Because when we cling to Thee, all of our problems and our troubles will vanish. The script, the song, the old song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world will grow strangely move in our midst today. Lord, I give thanks for these precious folks that are here to meet in the house of the Lord. And I just pray a blessing on them and their families, Lord, and safety as they go through this holiday weekend. If there's someone here that needs to make a move, Lord, I just pray they get that right before they leave. In Jesus' name I pray.